Amen. I've had the privilege over the last 10 plus years to be under the teaching of our senior pastor. And not only does this church have great praise and worship and great prayer warriors, but it's also a place where I've been able to learn and develop my faith to an even greater level. And God has answered the questions that relate to where I came from. What does it mean to live in this life? What's my purpose? It's also deep in my understanding as to what is right and what is wrong and ultimately where I will end up someday. So let's give a round of applause to our senior pastor, my senior pastor. Okay. Amen. Amen. Also, we want to welcome to the stage, you remember him from our summer apologetic series, the True ID podcast host, True ID podcast host, Adam Coleman. Welcome to the stage, folks. I would call him urban apologist, but he's just straight an apologist. Any topic, he's got you. Amen? All right, folks, so we're going to start off. Pastor Tony, you're going to start off with a few common questions that we have, and then we'll take it from the submission form. So get your questions in, folks. You know, I I told you um, already that for our New Year's Eve service, you know, you look at from 8 to 12, and you say, what are you going to be doing all all that time? We only got an hour left. Okay. Normally, normally when we have a Q&A, it normally takes an hour and a half to get through some of, most of the questions and we still always have to cut it. And so this time we're only going to maybe have a half an hour, if that, to answer some, some common questions. Let me, let, me just deal, um, let me deal with one right off the bat because it ties in with what uh, I wanted to get into uh, and, and help many of you with some of the uh, subjects and questions you're dealing with. Um, You know, one of the questions came in, what about someone who uh, reads the Bible, studies the Bible, comes to church and serve, hold your seat, but they smoke weed all the time? Stop smoking the weed. I'm telling you. I don't make these questions up, and I, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody's questions. I'm just stating, I just stated the question. Y'all the ones laughing. I'm just stating the question. Okay, let me bring it a little bit closer to home. What about someone who calls himself a Christian, reads the Bible, come to church, serve at church, and they drink alcohol? So, you know, and this is a a common thing across um, Christian circles uh, that the Bible doesn't forbid drinking, it forbids drunkenness. And I know that is a common thing uh, even amongst people of my ilk across the nation and around the world. And I just have a different take on that. And I'm going to tell you why I have a different take on that. Christianity has the broadest... um, the broadest ethic. We can do as Christians, we're at liberty to do anything and everything we want to do. However, the Bible is very clear in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and as well as 1 Corinthians 10, 23, it talks about, it says, all things are lawful. Meaning that the Christian has the broadest ethic around all things are lawful. We can do whatever we want to do. Watch it, but it continues. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. The word expedient there, that Greek word means to help along the way. All things are lawful, but all things won't help me along the way of being like Christ. Then he says, all things are lawful. Here it is, here it is. This is the point I wanted to get to. All things are lawful, the verse goes on to say, but I won't be brought under the power of any. Watch this. We as Christians can do whatever we want to do, but number one, we have to ask ourselves, will it help me in becoming more like Jesus Christ? Number one. And number two, watch this. Will it bring me under its power? 
Let's take it back to the original question of smoking weed or drinking alcohol. If you smoke weed or drink alcohol, will you be brought under its power? Then no, we have no liberty to do that. We have no liberty to do that which will bring us under its power. Will alcohol do that? Yes. Will smoking weed do it? Yes. Now, there's a total different thing concerning medical marijuana. There, there are those who need medical marijuana where that thing that takes out the high or whatever, that's a whole different subject, whole different situation. But here it is. You can do whatever you want to do. But ask yourself, will it help me along my way of being like Christ? And number two, will it bring me under his power? This is why I believe I have a different view on the whole thing of Christians drinking today. The reason why the, well, well, let me just say, there are 78 verses in the Bible dealing with why we should not drink. And I, I, can, I don't have time to get into the 78 verses, but there are 78 of them. And the thing about it is the reason why the Bible doesn't come right out in all cases and say no drinking alcohol is because wine was the common drink of the day. Now you have to understand uh, because people like to say Jesus turned water into wine and all that crazy stuff. But here's the thing. Jesus turned water into wine, but he didn't turn water into Hennessy. Okay. I think you got the point. Okay. You got the point. Here's the thing. You have to understand when wine is spoken of in the Bible, for the Jews, they will always, according to the mission of the Jewish uh, 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 traditions in the Bible or, or Jewish traditions in the community, they will always drink three parts water to every one part wine. In many cases, it was 25 to 1 when the wine became like a paste. It was 25 to 1 water to wine. So is the, wa is the wine in the Bible the same as the wine today? No, it's not. They didn't have Coca-Cola, Sprite, Pepsi, Pepsi, and the variety of Pepsi, and the variety. They didn't have that back then. So people don't have to drink today so because today we have a variety of drinks that we can drink. Sprite and Diet Sprite and Pepsi and Diet Pepsi and, and, and Coke and Diet Coke and Coke Light and all kind of a myriad of lemonades and things. They didn't have that back then. And therefore, the water back then, because we have a myriad of waters today, water back then uh, uh, was not purified like it is today. So the, the wine helped to purify the water. So whenever uh, you see in the Bible, the Jews or anyone in the Bible drinking wine, it, number one, it was at the lowest three parts water to one part wine, or at worst, it was 25 to one. So... Going back to the question of a person drinking uh, uh, alcohol or a person smoking weed. Number one, will it help me be more like Christ? No. Number two, will it bring me under its power? Yes, it can. Alcohol can. Well, I drink in moderation. Well, whose moderation? One beer for you may knock this person out over here. Who sets the standard of moderation? So, so you don't have to drink today. You don't. You don't have to. There's too many things out there to drink that it doesn't have to be alcoholic. So will it help me along the way in my Christian walk? And number two, will it bring me under its power? We, yes. Alcohol, yes. Smoking cigarettes, yes. The tobacco brings you under its power. You become addicted to it. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. So, that's the answer to that particular question, and I have to be careful because I, I, I can hear my wife when we get home. You took too long with each one of the questions, and that... Okay, what do y'all got to say? 
Well, well, Pastor Tony, Pastor Tony made some great points, and there's a myriad of things. We have our Celebrate Recovery ministry, and there's a myriad of things that we get addicted to <laughs> that we can get brought under the power of that yeah. you should avoid simply based on that principle. Yeah. And while we're talking about drinking and smoking, let's just move on to something close to that as well. Mixing of music. So someone asked, if, if you're a Christian, should you only listen to Christian music? What if you mix it with hip hop and rap? I'm guessing of a secular kind. Does that make you not a Christian? No, it, I mean, I mean, you know, if, if you listen to that which is not Christian, it's not like you got, that's a, 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 a sure one way ticket to hell. No, no. Uh, the Bible does say, um, in Colossians 3, 17, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, in everything that you do, do to the glory of God. So you have to ask yourself, will me listening to this music help me to glorify God? Yes or no? If me doing this sort of thing, will it help me glorify God? Because it says in everything, oh, matter of fact, Colossians 3, 17 says, in everything that you do in word or drink, due to the glory of God. So you have to ask yourself, if, if I'm drinking this, will it help me glorify God? If I'm smoking this, will it help me glorify God? If I'm listening to this, will it help me glorify God? And if you say no, then I just, for me, I wouldn't do it. But that's between you and the Lord. You got to let your conscience deal with you on that. But I'm just giving you what the word says. And then you you filter your situation through what the word says. That's my job is just to give you the word. And everything you do in word or dream, do to the glory of God. I'm going to add one little piece of that, too. It says, I can't do the whole chapter and verse. I can give you okay. the book. <laughs> I can't give you the chapter and verse. But in Proverbs, it talks about how um, it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for yeah. out of it flows the issues of life. 423. There you go. <laughs> So I, I feel, I feel yeah, you to lie yeah, with the yeah, book, yeah, and then yeah. you just finish it off with it. <laughs> but, but, you know, what goes in you is going to come out. You know, I, I say to people all the time, like, nobody's ever done a drive-by shooting listening to, you know, Sebastian Bach or something, listening to an opera. You know, it doesn't happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you listen to certain kinds of music, it inspires you to behave in a certain way or feel in a certain way or whatever. Or let's say if it's, uh, I mean, we could apply this to, to movies or something like that. I mean, if you're watching certain things on TV or in movies, you know, say of a lustful manner and, you know, that, that, can, that can impact you as well. So you got to yeah. be careful about all that kind of stuff. But you don't want to allow your entertainment to give the enemy a foothold to kind of sink his hooks in of temptation so that later on he can come and yeah. use it as yeah. a stepping stone to get you into some deeper stuff. So, yeah. yeah, that's good. I like that. Amen. We're always consuming, aren't we? Always. There's another qu question. Is there ever, especially with the political situation, I'm going to try to tread lightly. Is there ever a time a believer should disobey the government? Yeah. Um, Acts 5.29, um, uh, the government was telling the apostles uh, to not preach and teach the word of God anymore. And they said, look, we got to obey God rather than man. That is the only time we're called to disobey the governing authorities that are over us, that are established by God, according to Romans 13, verses 1 through 4, is when the government is telling us to do something that is contrary to Scripture. Then we got to obey God rather than man. Amen. Amen. Another person is saying that they don't read the Bible as much as they would like to or, or that they should. How do they get motivated to read the Bible more? And are they not a Christian because they're not reading as much as they should or not as often? Uh, no, I won't say that they're not a Christian. I would just say uh, that you've heard me uh, teach this many times. You're pigging out on the junk food of the world. Um, as, as you can see, you know, um, and I can tell you because I, I can no longer, you know, fit my clothes. But uh, my wife is a tremendous cook. Um, but if I pig out on Reese's peanut butter cups and stuff like that, when I get home, it doesn't matter what she cooked, my favorite meal, I won't have an appetite for it because I've been pigging out on the junk food uh, of Reese's and cheesecakes and all kind of other tomfoolery that's out there. 
But what happens is so often that we feed on the junk food of this world through the entertainment we listen to and by the things that we watch, that it takes away our appetite for the things of God and the word of God. And therefore, we have no appetite for it and we don't want it, not because we're, we're not a Christian. It could be that you're not a Christian, but if you are, uh, your appetite is taken away because you're feeding on other things of this world. Another thing, too, I would add, is, I mean, I'm just throwing my own personal experience, but um, when you're kind of going through life trying to figure things out, you keep making the same dumb mistakes over and over again. After a while, you'd be like, hey, you know, maybe I need to try something different. You know, so for me, yeah. what caused me to read the word more is just, you know, just making dumb mistakes. You know, yeah. so I was like, hey, I don't want to keep doing that over and over again. So let me try something different. Get God's wisdom, you know, live life according to his word. And then I, th I think that kind of helps you to, to keep going as well. When you realize, like, hey, you know, if I'm out here just, you know, living my own, my own kind of way, I mean, first of all, I mean, we're, we're Scripture commands that we need to be dependent on God for everything. So how can you be dependent on him if, you know, you're just kind of living by your own wisdom? I mean, so just yeah. a little tidbit there. Let, right. let, let me just say this. Um, going on to the next question, uh, the, there's a question that I remember that stood out to me. Um, you know, you hear people say, and you've heard many pastors and teachers say that we as believers, we're not under the law, the law of Moses, but we're under grace. And so if that is the case, um, are we not under the Ten Commandments? Um, do we not have to obey the Ten Commandments? Um, you know, you got to understand, uh, Romans 10, 4 says Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. What, what Christ did away with is he did away with the sacrificial law, which was the offering up of animal sacrifices in, in, in the place of the person's sin. And he did away with the ceremonial law, the feast days and all that sort of stuff. All those things were fulfilled in Christ. What is not done away with and what we still must obey is the moral law. The moral law is the Ten Commandments. A lie in the Old Testament is the same as a lie in the New Testament. Stealing in the Old Testament is the same as stealing in the New Testament. That moral law we are still under. However, here's where the part gets a little tricky, and it's funny because I'm going to be talking about this, God's will on Sunday, is that the only commandment that wasn't transferred over into the New Testament was the keeping of the Sabbath. Christ fulfilled the Sabbath in um, Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, when he says, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sabbath, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Christ is the fulfillment of the law, of the, of the Sabbath rest. And so outside of that, all the other commandments are forbidden in the New Testament just like the Old Testament. So the moral law, we're still obligated to fulfill. The ceremonial law and the sacrificial law is what Christ did away with. So when we, when we say we're not under the law, we're under grace. We're not under the law. When we sin, we march into the, march into the church with a lamb and a turtle dove and a ram to offer up as a sacrifice. We don't have to do that anymore. Christ fulfilled that. So that's what was done away with, the sacrificial law and the ceremonial law. But we're still obligated to keep the moral law. Does that mean I have to pay my taxes? I, I can't. Skip that, my amen. <laughs> <laughs> no, and no, that no stealing thing, yeah, huh? Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Um, if you don't remember the exact date you accepted Christ, are you not truly saved? Uh, it was you, submitted. I'm going no, to get that's, it. No, that's a legitimate question. Legitimate. Because I remember talking about this several times. Um, I said that, you know, matter of fact, I just mentioned it last Sunday. I said you cannot... Um, have an encounter with God and, and not remember that encounter. Think, keep in mind, encounter with the God of the universe. For me, for me, August 26, 1985, I had that encounter with the Lord. I never forget it. 
Now, there are some people, and this, I would say 10 years ago, I would have said, you're not saved. But I, I got a different view on it because of a, a, a Bible teacher that I respect highly. He said for him, he grew up in a, a he's, he's a fourth generation pastor. So for him, he grew up in that home. He, he, he does remember, you know, accepting Christ in his life, but it, it, it wasn't like this was my life before Christ. Christ came in it. This is my life now. He just said he just grew up in the home and he just it, and just walked with God and just he repented of his, and just kept kept him moving, kept walking with God. And he's, he's a pastor of over 50 years now. So there was a time I would have said. But I, I won't I won't be dogmatic about it. I won't. Yeah, not everybody gets knocked off of their horse and hears a voice and comes to the Lord that way. And there are some dramatic conversions that are some that are not so dramatic. So to yeah. your point, yeah. different people, different things. So ooh, what causes a person who is on fire for Christ to go astray all of a sudden? I mean, the Bible says that we're led astray by our, by our own lust. That's what it says. You know, and I think that... Um, Oh, James 1.13. <laughs> See, what happened was, last time I came up with a little Bible, and I was straight. Just yeah, like, I got to look it up, but they joked on me last time because I had this small Bible, so I didn't bring it this time. So now I'm up here looking crazy. But, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, yeah, but, I mean, we're led astray by our own lust. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's really what it is. I mean, people, you know, we all have a, a choice. We have the freedom of the will. We can either, you know, repent to, to, toward Christ or we can walk away from him. And I think what happens is it's kind of like uh, with Peter. You know what I'm saying? Like Peter was, was, I mean, rolling with Christ. You know, he's, I'll never deny you and all this kind of stuff. And when things got shaky, I mean, my man, he was willing to cuss to, <laughs> to deny Christ. And I mean, he, he, he dipped out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anybody, so the Bible says, take heed lest ye fall. And yeah. so the reality is we got to, it goes back to the previous question. We got to stay in that word. We got to stay in this presence. We got to stay in church. You know, yeah. in the communion yeah. of, the, of the body of believers, all those things are, in, are commanded in Scripture for a reason. I'm saying to, to, so that we can uh, be preserved in him. But yeah. 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 The, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray and turned every man to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all in um, Isaiah 53. Um, you know, yes, we, we all can go astray. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about that going astray. The Bible says in uh, Galatians 5.16, it says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But if you don't walk in the spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the spirit is walking in obedience to the word of God. If you're not walking in the spirit, you're going to walk in the flesh. Now, here's the thing. What is walking in the flesh? What does that look like? It means walking in those sins that God saved you from. Whatever it is you came out of, if you came out of alcoholism, you came out of, um, um, you know, drunkenness, you came out of, uh, you know, whatever lifestyle God saved you from. If you walk in obedience to the word, you're good. But if you walk in the flesh, you're going to walk back into those sins that God brought you out of, whatever that looks like. And Galatians 5, 19 through 21 gives us a list of those sins that we can walk back in. Those were the sins God delivered us from. Amen. Another question, if you've been here long enough, you already know the answer because Pastor Tony has taught us about this many times, but how does one, when presented with many options, determine the will of God for their life? What decision should they make? Yeah. If, if you've been here long enough, you know I've given, and I've given this message around the country as well, um, there, there are three ways you can know God's will for your life. Number one, uh, do you have a desire? Whatever it is you want to do, do you have a desire? We know that desire comes from God. Philippians 2, 13 says it is God who works in us both to will, that's desire, and to do the power to carry out his good pleasure. Uh, so do you have a desire? Number two, do you have a peace? P-E-A-C-E. Colossians 3.15 said, let the peace of God 
rule in your heart. The Greek word for rule means to act as a referee, meaning that the peace of God will act as a referee, calling the balls and strikes in our lives, saying that decision you just made was out of here, or that decision you made was safe. And then number three, is there an open or closed door? Revelation 3, 7 and 8 says God will open up doors no man can close and closed doors no man can open. It needs to be all three. Whatever it is you want to do, you want to move here, go there, marry them, do this, whatever. Uh, do you have a desire to do this? And it must be all three. Then number two, do you have a peace? Number three, is the door open for you? If so, if it's yes to all three, of the, that can be a desire. And it's, I can add a fourth if it's in the word of God. Uh, but I can, I can safely say you're in line with what God will want you to do. Now, some people say, well, I got two of the three. Yeah, I didn't say two of the three. I said all three. Because you can have a desire and you can have a peace, but the door isn't open yet. That just means it's not God's timing. It may be his will, but not his timing. And so you have to wait. Let's say, for example, the door is open, you have a desire, but something is in you saying, don't walk down that aisle with that person. Don't do it. Something's in you like, you better not do it. You better not take that job, that position, do that thing, whatever it is you desire, move out of state, take that for sale sign down. You don't have a peace. And so those are three ways to know God's will. Well, we live in a world, as you know, where the Bible is coming under a constant attack. People are willing to change their faith and to walk away from Christ based on a video or an internet meme. And it only takes one for some reason. They could be in church for years. So we're living in this kind of climate. How do we handle those who are in colleges or have come across a YouTube channel? There are atheistic ones and ones from every false religion and cult out there. How do we deal with accusations against the text of the Bible, saying that it was forged, saying that it was copied, and how do we deal with those kinds of accusations in school and on the internet? What should we do and where should we go to get information? I go a lot of different directions with that one, but. I know. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I think, um, actually I'm gonna go a different direction than what I normally do. I think, you know, relationship is, is under, underrated in terms of how we engage people. One thing you don't wanna do is just because somebody disagrees with you or has a different viewpoint, it doesn't have to be a shouting match. It doesn't have to be a shouting match. I got people that on my Facebook page, I've been dialoguing with like for years, I mean, stone cold atheists. I'm saying they keep coming back to my page. They know what I'm about, what I'm about and the whole nine. But you know, I keep the, the door open. As long as they're respectful, I'm gonna be respectful. So I just you know, wanna say that right there. I mean, we don't have to, just because people are being, you know, you know, throwing stones at you doesn't mean you have to throw them back. But if you're dealing with a, with a believer, you know, come alongside and pray with them. You know what I'm saying? Ask them some of the fundamental questions, like, are you involved in a local church? I'm saying, are you, you know, studying your word? Like, you know, what's, what's your walk like? Because if somebody who's, you know, um, engaging in those fundamentals, it's going to be a lot harder for the enemy to knock them off their square. So sometimes it's not an intellectual issue. It's that they've gotten off either in the sin or something like that. And you can talk the intellect stuff all day long. It's not going to matter because that's not the root issue. You know what I'm saying? So if you're dealing with a believer, you want to ask those kind of questions. Now, as far as the information, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a wealth of stuff, you know, um, tell them to come <laughs> to Calvary Chapel yeah. on, on Sunday morning, you know, yeah. where we go through the, through the scriptures, line by line, precept upon precept, and Pastor Tony is covering apologetics related material as we go through the word of God. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's, you know, invite them to church. Um, uh, or you go to True ID podcast as well, <laughs> you know, shameless plug. Yeah. But, but, you know, aside from that, man, there, there's so many, you know, different uh, resources out there, whether it be, you know, Robert Zacharias, Wendell Lane Craig, and so on and so forth. Having a couple of those resources in your back pocket that you're familiar with, you know, so that, you know, depending on the question that they're, they're grappling with, yeah. you can re you refer them to a reliable source that you've come to. That's always helpful because you might not have the answer. I mean, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm not on mission. Right. But if I don't know, I can point you in the right direction as to, as to who does, you know. Um, but, you know, we live in a microwave society. I mean, you know, YouTube is uh, just really shaking a lot of people. I mean, it could be, like you said, a five-minute video, and somebody's think they debunked 2,000 years of church history. It's just like, come on, <laughs> yeah. man, you know. Yeah. Uh, but just asking them questions. You know, everybody wants to be skeptical about the Bible, skeptical about God. You know, but often, I say this all the time, they're not skepti skeptical about their skepticism. You know what I'm saying, you know, what, ask them questions, you know, back. You know, like, what, what, why, how did you come to that conclusion about, 
you know, the Bible and not being, you know, not being reliable or what have you. So I think those kind of things can, can really be helpful. You know, knowing a couple of sources, being able to refer people. Uh, there, there's a couple of books, real thin little books. Um, nowadays, you know, I've learned from Stiff that you can probably download it on your phone or something. There are two little books, Know What You Believe and Know Why You Believe by a guy named Paul Little. Uh, the little thin books is just what we believe in the historic Christian faith and why we believe those things. Those two little books, you master those two little books um, and you know, you, you'll be able to not only know what we have believed for 2,000 years, but why, why we believe it. Let me, let me just deal with this, I thought about a question. I thought about a question. Uh, uh, someone asked the question, why is it that we teach verse by verse here at this church? Uh, most churches teach topical messages, um, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, and, and we have chosen, because this is how Calvary chapels are worldwide, we, we teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book for this reason. Um, you know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration is a word that means God breathed. God breathed it out. All scripture does God breathe. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteous, righteousness. Why? Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So what happens is, as we teach verse by verse, we're teaching all of God's word so you can be thoroughly equipped to deal with the folks that, that pose threats against Christianity. I'm, I'm equipping you. Um, and, and that's an important word there. So we, this is why we do this. And so this is what we believe. We believe that if you teach all of the Bible, you cover all the topics. So there's no need to pick topics being John this week and Revelation next week and Ezekiel the following week and Mark the next. No, you, you end up with a spiritual upset stomach. We, we, we're seeking to give you a balanced diet of the word of God. Uh, Paul said something in Acts 20. He said, somebody excited about that. Well, Paul, Paul said in Acts 20 in verse 27, he, he said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So if all of God's word is from Genesis to Revelation, we need to teach it all. Jesus says something else as well. He, Jesus said, you're easily deceived by not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. What he is saying is that the power of God is in knowing the scripture. So it is my job to teach you all of God's word. So no one can knock on your door and say, well, the book of Zephaniah, and you'd be like, excuse me, the book of what? And you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we taught that, we learned that in our church, and blah, 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 blah. No one will be able to deceive you by any book of the Bible because we're going to teach it all. So it keeps us balanced. It keeps us from getting caught up in kooky, weird doctrines, because as we go through the word, we will have to balance that doctrine out with the rest of the scripture. So this is why we do what we do here. And if you would notice, I teach uh, it, in theological circles, it's called topical expositionally, meaning that as I grow, go verse by verse through the word, there are certain topics that are being picked out as I go systematically through the word of God. These 10 verses are covering this subject. These 10 are covering this subject. So even though I'm going verse by verse, I'm going topically expositionally. And like I said, once you go through all of the Bible, you cover all the topics. Hey, yeah, I just, can, can I say something real quick too? Just, just real quick. So like in terms of um, you know, the, the doubters and folks in the colleges and whatnot, um, also, beware the, the atheist or unbeliever double standard, right? Because, so, so you know, perfect example. Anybody remember uh, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey? Anybody remember <laughs> yeah. reading that in school? One of the most boring things I've ever read, but <laughs> we had to read it when I was in school. So any, anyway, this ancient text, you know, and to date, they've got about 700 manuscripts, I'm saying different copies from ancient times of Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, what happens is historians will look at that and say, hey, look, we've got all these copies 
and can compare them to one another such that we know what the original said. That's how they, you know, that's how they can understand what was the original, you know, what was the content of the original, how many copies that they have. So you got about 700 or so for the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. And that's regarded as being like stellar. I mean, for the ancient world, that's like, we can you yeah. know, rely upon this text as being accurate, right? Now, when it comes to the New Testament, you know, you've got about 6,000 yeah. manuscripts for the New Testament, just 50, in the original language. Yeah, 5,500 right? to 6,000, yeah. Right, yeah. right, and that's, that's just dealing with the Koine Greek. Once you get to like, you know, the Coptic language and Syriac and some of those, those other ancient languages, it puts you up at about 25,000. So if historians can speak to about the, the, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey as being reliable, you know, you're dealing with 700 copies. Like how yeah. much more can we say about the New Testament where you got yeah. you know, between 5,500 and 6,000? Yeah. So when people come with that, man, I mean, nobody's running around talking about, oh, man, we can't trust the Iliad. <laughs> <I'm saying laughs> right. But they always want to take aim at the Bible. Yeah. And again, it's just a double standard. So you got to kind of really watch for that. Uh, unfortunately, we, we may have time for just one more question. See, it's gone already. Time gone already. Um, um, so all right. I will, let it rip. Uh, I'll, I'll give this last one here. If God has a purpose for everyone on earth, what is his purpose for non-believers and atheists? Why does he allow them to live? That got to end on a toughie. Well, yeah, way to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible says, but the Bible makes very clear that God desire all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9. Uh, so God desire all men to be saved. So because Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he made it possible for man to be savable. But God has given man a choice to choose him or to reject him. So when a man goes to hell, he can't say, God, why would you put me here? No, you put yourself there. By rejecting everything from your conscience to every church on the corner to Christian friends and all this sort, you got to jump over all of them to go into hell yourself. But his, his heart's desire is to see people saved. And if you're here today and you have not repented of your sin and accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're only here because of some weird tradition of being in a church for, for bringing in the new year, and then that means the rest of the year you can just do you, then you're in for a rude awakening. I'm pleading with you. The Bible says we're ambassadors of Christ as if Christ is pleading through us. God is pleading through us to be reconciled to Christ. I'm here to say repent of your sin and come to Christ while you can. And this is because he desired all men to be saved. So atheists and agnostics and all that kind of stuff and all that. See, and, and then that will move me into one of the questions that I was looking at on the thing. It was it's right in line with this. And it was dealing with, um, um, you know, reformed theology and, um, you know, those who believe that God has predestined some to heaven and predestined some to hell. That's just... No, that's not, how, that's not how any of this is done. And there's some very fine Christians and scholars and men of God over the years who've held to reform theology. And I just, you know, it, no, that's not how any of this is done. Watch this. God, if he chose to do that, God would be just as just because we all deserve to go to hell. If God looked in eternity's past, because he knows all things, and he looked at everyone who will ever be born, and he says, I choose you, I choose you, I don't choose you, I don't choose you, I choose you and choose you. He will be just if he did it that way. Why? Because we all supposed to go to hell because we all were born into sin. However, if he did it that way, yes, he will be just, but he will be a respecter of persons. Something Acts 10.34 um, and, and, and um, uh, this is Ephesians 6.9, 
uh, 1 Timothy 5.21, all of those things that God shows uh, personal favoritism to no man. But if he did it that way, he will be just, but he'll be showing personal favoritism. And God said he doesn't show personal favoritism. So I do not believe, I do not hold to, nor believe, nor feel any justification for those holding to reform theology. And then that goes into the final question that I was scrolling through, is um, there's a teaching called cessationists. It, it just means that there is a group of people, and reformed reform theology people are in that group, who said that all the miracles in the Bible, all the miracles of the New Testament in the book of Acts, they stopped at the last apostle. After John the apostle died around, around AD 96, all the miraculous things in the Bible has ceased. And I said, well, why? Is it that we don't need that today? Oh, that, that everybody from John on, uh, 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 you know, we, we don't need that. They said, well, because we have the completion of the Bible. I said, that is the dumbest excuse I've ever heard in my life. Because we got the completion of the Bible, we no longer need God to do the miraculous in our lives? Are you kidding me? But see, I, I dug a little deeper because this is the reason behind that sort of belief. In 1906, there was the Azusa Street Revival. During that particular revival that took place in LA, that something took place for the first time in many years, God was doing the miraculous. God was doing things, they were laying hands on folks who were sick, they were recovering, there were arms that was chopped off, that was growing out, all kinds of things that were going on at the Azusa Street Revival. It was out of Azusa Street that the Pentecostal, Charismatic, and all these movements came out of as a result of Azusa Street that really went back to the Welsh Revival of 1904. However, since that started to happen and these groups came, if you would notice all of the commentaries from 1950 on, they took the passage in 1 Corinthians 13 that says that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part, verse 12, will be done away with. They said when that which is perfect is come, it's the completion of the Bible. And since the completion of the Bible, all those other miraculous things no longer exist. I said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. Because prior to 1950, if you look at all the commentaries, they interpret 1 Corinthians 13, right around verse 12 or so, with that which is perfect is come, is the coming of Jesus Christ. Everyone talked about that. Paul's writings, it talks about the coming of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes back, there will be no need for tongues and interpretation of tongue, tongues of miraculous or healings. There'll be no need for that. We'd be in heaven. There's no need for that stuff. But then after 1950, commentators said, oh, no, it's not talking about Jesus Christ coming. It's talking about the completion of the Bible. And I just said, y'all are too smart to be this stupid. Are you kidding me? That is crazy. In Paul's writings, every time he talks about someone coming, it is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Except when they get to that passage, they say it's the completion of the Bible. And I just hit my head and just say, you got to be kidding me. So this is the thing. It's a teaching that is out there that says that when the last apostle died, so did the, the, the miraculous things died with it. And that is just not biblical in my humble opinion. Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to Pastor All right. Tony All right, bro. and to Adam Pullman. All right.